So we're in this chapter on fluid statics. Uh, a lot of the concepts we've already covered, especially at the beginning, what is pressure? What is pressure? Force per unit area? Hydrostatic pressure uh, in a stagnant fluid. Before we move to flowing fluids, just think of static fluids. So pressure at a fluid at rest is the same in all directions. So if I have a point of interest right here in this static fluid, I can cut an area this way, this way, this way, this way, and it's no matter what the orientation of that small area at that point, the pressure is the same normal force, force per unit area. If I change the location of the point, I go deeper into the fluid, well then the pressure changes as a function of depth. How about when I move from this point to that point that have the same depth in a gravitational field? Do the two pressures have the same value? Yes. Yeah, they have the same value. So uh, some people will call this uh, Stebbins principle or Stebbins law. The pressure in a fluid at rest increases with depth. That's all. And then you can get into um, apparent uh, contradictions such that, let's take a look at this problem right here. I have just a straight cylinder. What about the, the second case, case B versus case A? What's different? Well, it's as I go deeper into my container from the free surface, up here is our free surface, it's wider and wider. And then how about this one? It's, it's for case C, it's wide at the top and narrow at the bottom. Well, what did I know about the depth at this point in case A, this point in case C, B, and this point in case C? They all have the same depth. Do they have all the same pressure? Yes. Yeah. And then you think about it. Well, I'm going to have to support then this, if I think about a free body diagram acting on that fluid column, they have the same pressure, but this one has a larger area but the same pressure, this one has a smaller area, same pressure. That doesn't make any sense because this, this has a lot of fluid that it has to support above it, but all I'm going to have is a small pressure right there. To I mean, a small area with the same magnitude of pressure. And this pressure right here is the same as that pressure, but it's acting over a larger area seems like it should support a lot more fluid, but if you just look at it, maybe it's supporting the same amount of fluid. So what, what did we miss in our free body diagram as we're analyzing some of the forces in the whatever, let's call this the, the Y direction? Yeah, it's the forces acting on the sides of the cylinder. So in this case right here, the force um, acting on that fluid column right here is always perpendicular to that area, perpendicular to that wall, hence it's contributing nothing in the x or the y direction. What about this one though? But the wall is now pushing down on the fluid on the sides, right? So if the if the fluid's pushing this way on the wall, and I'm taking a free body diagram only of the fluid, then the fluid's feeling a force pushing back from the wall. The wall's pushing back on that fluid column in that direction, and it has a downward component to it. Yeah, and in this case, it has an upward component. The wall has a, a force that's pushing a component in the upward direction such that, yes, you do have the same pressure on the bottom in all three cases, as Stevens' principle will show, and you can have these um, fluid columns, even though they're not um, the same cross-sectional area, can have a free body diagram, and you can compute that the sum of the forces in the Y equal to zero. It's like a contradiction, but you work it out carefully and you, it works. Okay? All right. 
Um, a lot of times you'll see some crazy shape and then they'll ask you, okay, compare the pressure at A compared to the pressure at D. What can you conclude? They're the same. But uh, this is a, a solid, let's say you're a scuba diver and you're going underneath something and this is a lot of large mass sticking out, right? So that's heavy rock. If that broke off, it would drop to the bottom of the water. But <clears throat> when you are scuba diving and you're not underneath that large rock mass, but then you go underneath that large rock mass, <clears throat> did the pressure go up? <coughs> Excuse me. No, the pressure didn't go up. Isn't the pressure at E the same as? Yeah, that's the same pressure. Uh, and likewise here. So if you look straight up from F, you would think, oh my, you know, I have this weight of this fluid, but then I have the weight of the rock on top, and then the weight of the fluid. This has to be higher pressure, but it's not. It's the same pressure as this pressure, which only has fluid on top of it. All right. Um, let me jump back. There's another classic type of problem. They'll have a container like this, then they'll have it sloped and maybe I don't know, do something like this. And they'll say, calculate the pressure at this point A, and the fluid's filling the container like that. And it really doesn't matter. They may even give you the slope here. The slope here, the angle here is phi. Is the angle phi relevant to this problem? Not at all. And you'll see a problem like this probably on the FE exam. <laughs> And they want you to start going, oh, they gave me phi. I must use it. What, how does it affect the pressure at the point A along that surface? It doesn't. Only thing is, is the depth of that point A in the fluid from the free surface. Well, Pascal's principle for a confined fluid at rest, if the pressure is increased in one part, so how would you increase the pressure in one part? You typically take a piston and push down on it to try to change its volume, but if it's a liquid, it's not going to change its specific, it's pretty incompressible, so it's not going to change its specific volume much. What it'll do is boost the pressure. But if you change the pressure at this one point here, the same increase in pressure is felt everywhere in the fluid, in that confined fluid. So where do we find that? useful. Well, we can find it when we talk about hydraulic fluids, hydraulic pressures, and the mechanical advantage that we enjoy from hydraulic machinery. So this is the classic example. So I have a small area, little piston here, and I have a large piston over here. They're showing the piston here. And uh, let's say I, I uh, move this piston down a little bit I'm trying to um, change that, um, well, I apply a force F that exerts what type of pressure underneath this piston 1 over here on this side. Isn't that pressure over here at 1, isn't that the force down on that piston divided by the area of the piston? All right. Now we go from this point all the way over. What's the pressure? underneath that larger piston over here. P1 and P2 are equal. Whoops. P1 and P2 are equal, the same pressure. But we see that P2 is equal to F2, this downward force, F2, acting on the much larger area, A2, so that we find that the force F2 divided by A2 is equal to F1 divided by A1, or put the A2 over on this side. And this is our mechanical advantage, the ratio of the areas. So if you apply maybe, I don't know, 100 uh, newtons or kilonewtons here, and your mechanical advantage is 10, the area 2 divided by area 1 is 10. Then you just take and multiply 100 kilonewtons. So 10, you can lift 10 times that. That's how hydraulic systems work. Do you remember being little and 
drive a car into the shop, first time you see a car get lifted, wow, this is incredible, by the hydraulic lifts. Very heavy car just went up. Or you pull a little jack out, you start jacking up your car. Little jack can do wonders. <clears throat> so we've solved a lot of fluid statics problems already before this class, a little bit already in this class, but let's just talk about a uh, submerged uh, planar surface, flat surface that is uh, submerged and its orientation is horizontal. Horizontal to what? The free surface. So the free surface is here and there's our surface. Somebody said, I have a round cover uh, and it's over a pipe and inside the pipe is air, atmospheric pressure. Over here is air, atmospheric pressure. Calculate the, the hydraulic force or the the, the, the fluid static force on this uh, round disc. Well, you'd say, well, I know that the pressure is perpendicular to the area, and it's a planar surface, so anywhere it's always pointed downward, the fluid pressure. What is the magnitude of that fluid pressure? Well, the magnitude of the fluid pressure is going to be the mass density of the fluid times G times the depth below the free surface, H1. Wouldn't that give us the pressure at that surface? And then we're going to do it gauge pressure. Usually atmosphere just cancels out on both sides. So we have atmospheric pressure in the air underneath and atmospheric pressure up here. So we'll just do the gauge pressure. So rho GH is the uh, gauge pressure there. And if I take that pressure and multiply it by the area, which is pi r squared, or they gave me B, is B the radius or the diameter? diameter? Diameter, so wouldn't that be pi B squared over four for the area? And then I can calculate that net force acting down from a distributed load. So I replace that distributed load by a resultant single force acting downward, same direction, which is just rho G H1 times pi b squared over 4, the pressure times the area. And then I just have to say, where do I apply that force? Where does it make sense to apply that force? And you look at that area, which is a circular disk, and you apply it logically in the center of that area. That location is called the centroid, the centroid of the area. What happens if somebody said, no, I don't have a round disc, I have a triangular disc. And it's given by uh, this width B and this uh, at the base, the height A. So you can kind of see the projection doesn't, the side projection doesn't look much different than the round disc, does it? Looks the same. Well, what is my magnitude of the resultant force? I'm going to apply a resultant force downward, right? I need to get the magnitude first. Would that be the pressure, which is rho g h1, uniform over that triangular area, times the area? What is my area for this? Make that on your equation sheet if you have, right? You want to write all kinds of stuff down. So it's one half the base, which is A, times the height, B. Is that true? Yeah. And so we'd put that area right there, and that would be the magnitude. Somebody says, where do I apply it now? Where did we apply it over here? We applied it right in the middle. We want to apply it at the centroid of that triangular area, which a lot of people already are saying, look at, go from the base to the tip, and go out one-third of the distance from the base to the tip. It'll be somewhere along that line, the one-third mark. And from symmetry, it'll be somewhere along that line. Where do they intersect? They intersect at this point, and that point is one-third from the base out to the tip, right in the middle. What happens if my red area would have looked like this? Where would that 
where do I need to apply the resultant force? One third and one third. So you're looking at it, you come out a third this way and a third that way, and it looks like it's right around there. Very good. We'll spend some more time doing that, but how did you get that it needs to be a third? What, consider, what did you need to consider going back to statics? Moments, moments of the force. So you have a distributed load, each little segment of the distributed load contributes a force, and you want the equivalent uh, moment, some of the moments about an axis for the simplified system as well as the original system, which was for a distributed uh, force field or pressure system. We're going to spend a little more time here because I want to uh, make sure we understand the one-third rule, which most of you already have uh, said. So if I have a submerged vertical surface, what surface am I interested in? This red surface right there. It's on the edge of this wall. Um, it comes up all the way to the water the, or the, whatever fluid I have, and it goes all the way down to the depth. What, if I look at a side projection, it looks like this. There's the, the, the depth 0 to h, okay? The y coordinate's going to measure our depth going down, y. And what, what is this dimension here? I don't know, some w, some, some uh, depth in that third dimension, which is hard to see on the left. So sometimes that third dimension is throws us, it makes it challenging for us to keep track of. But think of w. w is the depth. Okay. So uh, we could say, what is the pressure? that the water exerts at the top when y is equal to zero. Well, the pressure is zero, isn't it? What about the pressure at the bottom in the, when y is equal to h? When y is equal to h, it's rho gh. So the pressure is going to be linearly distributed. It'll have a triangular shape, the force distribution, force per unit area, the pressure, just like this. And so everywhere, uh, it's perpendicular acting in the positive x direction. Okay. So what is the resultant force, the magnitude? Of, there's two questions when I want to replace the more complicated distributed load by a single point load is I have a magnitude of the resultant force. What would be the magnitude of that resultant force equal to f of r? Yeah, it'd be one half. Then you have rho g times h. So this would be the pressure at the bottom. The pressure at the top is zero. And then you have one half. Isn't this the average pressure over that surface? And then we multiply by the area of the surface. Let me put it like this. The area of the surface is going to be h times w, this w right here. How did we get that? Yeah, let's be a little tedious here, and let's say, I mean, I think I can fit it into this little bit of white space over here. We're interested in f of r, and we're going to sum a little over a bunch of f of r's. That's classical, right? I have a bunch of little DFs, and I'm going to sum them up. I'll say that's going to be an integration. Well, what's each of those DFs equal to? Uh, PDA, pressure times a small area. But what's my small area? Well, I'm going to integrate by changing Y going downward. And so this single resultant force, the magnitude, is equal to the, pre the integral of the pressure times the area is going to be the depth dy. Isn't that dA? The depth w times a little dy. dy. 
And what we find is that pressure is a function of y. So we have to put in rho gy w dy integral. This is mathematically how we're going to rederive that simple expression that we just had. True. So um, can I pull outside of the integral rho g and w because they're constant? What does it leave inside the integral? So rho g w, the integral of y dy. Where do we want to start the integration, the summation? At I introduce this coordinate system. We start y equal to 0, and it goes downward until y is equal to h. So 0 to h. Make sense so far? Let me pause for a minute. Did I make an error? Or do you agree? If you agree, give me a thumbs up. The W stands for this distance in the third dimension. Sometimes W's do stand for loads in different problems. Look right. Integral of y dy. One half y squared, evaluated at the limits 0 to h, h squared. So we're going to have rho g w. And then I can say this. Let's do this. Rho g, let's put the 1 half in front of it all. Then we'll put the rho g h. Then we'll put the h w. And doesn't it look like what we just said? So once you're familiar with where it came from and the integration, then you leave the integration aside and you remember, oh, basically if I wanted to calculate the magnitude of the resultant force due to a triangular distributed load, it would be one half, I like to think of taking it and making the whole thing have the same pressure as if it's on the bottom of rho gh over the entire area and then multiply that by a half. So it's like a, a rectangular distributed load then cut in half to make the triangular load. Okay? So the initial load wasn't zero, you just do p at the top? We're going to do that in a second, yep, if, the, if it's not at zero at the top. But we need to make sure we get this down. Now, the next part is, is once I know the magnitude, where do I place it? Where do I place it? And you already know the answer. You said it before. Where are you going to place this resultant single force, F of R, acting on this side of the wall? Where are you going to replace it? Two-thirds down or one-third up? Either way. But if you're in your coordinate system right here, because Y is measured down, wouldn't you place it right here where y is equal to two-thirds h? Two-thirds down or one-third up. True? Now, we know that, but let's derive that. How do we derive that? Just like we, we knew this magnitude for f of r, and then we went and derived it. How do we derive that? Well, the, the, the single force, the single resultant force applied at that location, must have the same moment about an axis, or in 2D, about a point, as the distributed force field about that same axis or point. Well, in 2D, we think about moments around a point. But we know that in 3D, that point comes out and is an axis. So where is our point that's most logical? It could be this point, or it could be that point, or if you wanted to, you could pick the middle point right there, either one, three choices of points. Let's pick this point because uh, y is zero at that point, and as we move further away, we don't have to have you know, something minus y you know, to, for the right distance. Everything will be from, uh, the distance will be uh, from y e equal to zero. So this is my point. Let's call that point A. Okay? 
So if I wanted to do the sum of the moments around point A, the point, the, the, the resultant force, F of R, needs to have the same equivalent moment around point A as the distributed um, force due to the pressure. That makes sense? Okay, well, this left side is really easy, is I'm going to be multiplying F of R, which we just calculated, that magnitude. Here's the equation for how to calculate the magnitude F of R times some appropriate single distance, and let's call it y sub r. What do you mean y sub r? It's the location where I need to apply that resultant. I don't know it. This equation's going to give me the formula for y sub r, and what's the formula for y sub r? Better be 2 thirds h. Otherwise, look for my error. Okay. Well, over here now on the right-hand side of this equal sign, what is the way I can describe the sum of the moments due to this pressure field, this distributed load? Well, didn't we just do something like that? This is due to the distributed force field or just the pressure field. So we say, hmm, we're going to do the summation where we're going to have a bunch of little um, DFs, but we have to multiply each little df by the distance, the y. Is it integral y df? And then we replace the df by p dA, integral y p dA. Does that make sense? All right. What is my uh, pressure? Is that rho g y times y? times the area is that third dimension W times dy, the integral. What is my lower limit? I'm going to start at the top. I'm going to go to the bottom, H. Let me pause. Does that look okay? Hope I didn't, well, I don't think I ran, I don't think I left enough room. Let me try it. Let's say this is now rho G W, those are my constants, they come outside. I have the integral of y squared dy is that one third y cubed evaluated zero to h. Thumbs up if you agree. All right, let me scroll down. Sorry, I didn't leave enough room. So I'm going to have rho g w one third h cubed. True? Okay. Let's come over here. I have x of r. What I'm trying, not x of r, y sub r. What I'm trying to solve for. What is f of r? Well, I could leave it as f of r, but I already know it. Let me put it over here. It's 1 half rho g h h w. Isn't that f of r? Now we can cancel the rho and the G and the W and two of the H's and we're left with the result that Y sub R is equal to bring that one half over so we have two thirds H. Isn't that what we wanted to show? That it's two thirds H? So, looks good. Professor, I was ready to, to, to uh, trust that result before the derivation and before the integration. Well, but the integration and the derivation support the result, and that's where the result comes from. True? So, there you go. It only gets now, it's, I hate to say it, a little more complicated. So, you ready to get a little more complicated? Because this, you sort of like review these basic results, you say, this is easy. I'm glad. <laughs> Let's move on. So in summary, when you have a, a distributed load, you have an equivalent force system where you calculate F of R. 
And then your uh, triangular, you look for that one-third or two-thirds. Either way, you look at it, two-thirds h or one-third h. Um, one thing about the calculating the f of r, somebody said, look at the way you calculate it is you're, you're going to go from here to here, go halfway down, get the pressure right there, and then multiply by the area. Will that give me f of r? Is f of r equal to the pressure at the, let me call this the centroid, of the area. The pressure halfway down, the centroid of that area, and then multiplied by the area. It's true. And then the next thing is, is where do I apply it? Don't apply it at the centroid. Apply it at a special point called the center of pressure. Where is the center of pressure? The center of pressure for the triangular distributed load is right here, it's one-third up, two-thirds down, center of pressure. So a lot of times you'll see the centroid and the center of pressure. The first time you see it, it's like, what? Why can't I evaluate the pressure at the same point that I apply the resultant force? Because you won't get the right moment <laughs> about some other point, you know, some axis or point. All right. Well, then we only get more complicated, don't we? So let's take the, a general problem. You find this in almost every statics textbook, fluid statics textbook. And uh, you'll have an area that we show as a length A and a width B. It's a rectangular submerged area. And you don't really care about the back side of it. You just care about one side of it. So let's talk about this as the top side. And we think about it being submerged not at the top, it's not up here, it's some distance where you're looking at a coordinate system, which is funny, but this is the way a lot of people do it. It's actually pretty easy this way. Run the coordinate system y, starting at y equal to zero at the surface of the fluid. All right. And so where is my planar star surface start at? At a location y1. What is y1 again? It's that distance, right? Running straight axis down. What is y2? Is this distance y1? No, that distance, if you wanted to call this distance a name, give this distance a name, what do you think you would call that? H1. H1. Call this H1. From trigonometry, maybe I should take a break and pause. <laughs> Uh, can you tell me what is the relationship between H1, Y1, and phi? You got it. Do you see the right triangle? This is the hypotenuse. So it's Y1, the hypotenuse, times the sine of the angle phi is H1. How about H2? Same, but you use Y2 instead of Y1. So it's a little, you know, you got to get comfortable with the, the uh, new coordinate system Y. There you go. So that's our new coordinate system Y. All right. And so what does our pressure look like at Y1? Well, this pressure is going to be rho G H1, isn't it? H1 is Y1 sine of phi. What about the pressure down here? It's going to be larger. That's why we show a longer distance of that pressure, right? It's longer distance for that pressure field. That'll be rho GH2. Is this a triangular distributed force field? No. Is it a rectangular? No. What do you call this one? Got it. Trapezoid. Trapezoidal type of shape, which to me means that it's made up of a rectangular component and a triangular component. That's, that's what a trapezoid is. To me, a triangle sitting on top of a rectangle. Okay? Okay. So now the question is, is for this submerged planar surface, can I calculate F of R, I want to replace this pressure field by a single resultant 
force. We know that it, the single resultant force is perpendicular to the area, so it's not going to be like coming in this way, is it? No, it's going to be just like this. It's going to be perpendicular to the area, right? So we know the direction of f of r. It's really the magnitude of f of r and the point of application. So what's the magnitude of f of r? That's the good one. You, you can go back and do it the integration way. Or you can do it like, hey, I've done this integration problem before with the calculus, and it's just going to be the pressure at the centroid of the area. If you don't like to spell out centroid, put pressure at C, subscript C, and say, okay, C means the centroid to me. Okay. Times the area. Will that work? Yeah, it'll work. It'll work. So would this be the location of the centroid, or does the centroid like one-third up from here? No, no, it's going to be one-half, right in the middle, isn't it? Yeah. Right in the middle. All right. So what is going to be the, the pressure, if I, if I wanted to calculate that? What is the pressure there? How about y1 plus y2 divided by 2 times sine of phi? That will give me h at the center, centroid. If I do y1 plus y2 divided by 2, doesn't it put it right in the middle? And then if I do the uh, sine of phi, is that the, the right pressure? And then I multiply by the area, which is uh, a times b for this problem. A times B for this problem. Right? Makes sense? Somebody says, I don't trust that. I think I trust my uh, mathematical skills to do the integration. Well, what would the integration look like? Um, F of R would be the sum of the little DFs. We've done that before. We're going to think of little strips going this way and integrating with respect to y, so it's really a, a pressure times dA, which is the integral of the pressure times B times dY, and I'm going to integrate from y goes from y1 to y2. Did I, did I jump too many steps there? It's going to be a good precursor to redeveloping and reestablishing the equation for the center of pressure when we do moment consideration. I did it for the simp we just did it for the simpler triangular. Here is a submerged trapezoidal type of problem, um, submerged surface. So let's do this. What is P? P is going to be rho G Y sine of phi. Yes or no? Good. B times dy. Integrate from y1 to y2. So the rho, the g, the sine uh, of phi, the sine of phi come outside. The b comes outside. We have the integral of y dy. So 1 half y squared evaluated y1 to y2. So we get rho g sine of phi b one half um, y two squared minus y one squared one fourth. Hold it. Sorry. This is y. I got it one times one times. That's it. True. So, uh, uh, that's right. Thank you. That's what I'm looking for. So, we can separate this at y2 minus y1 times 
y2 plus y1. That's what I'm looking for. Thank you. And what was a? It's y2 minus y1. So this can be substituted for a right here. And um, we're left with the 1 half y2 plus y1, which checks. We're left with the a, which checks. We're left with the b, which checks. The sine of phi, which checks in the row g. All right. Um, I need to do something here. Let me do this. Edit. Oh, let's do this. Uh, copy. It's a new page. Paste. All right. But now what we have to do is we have to calculate where should I apply that resultant force? Let me do it mathematically. Let me encourage you to do it mathematically. Let me encourage you to do it with the tools of calculus and integration, true? So what is my uh, basic equation to say? Well, I already know what is f of r. And I need, to, I know, I need to calculate y. And I'm going to put cp here because the name of it is I'm going to calculate the center of pressure. Where do I apply the resultant force for the right moment? And it won't be, it will not be right in the middle. It won't be at the centroid. Because of this shape, it'll be just a little south of it. So I'm going to be looking for, this is YC, the, the location of the centroid of that area. And this is Y sub CP, the center of pressure. Okay. The center of pressure, because if it would just be a, a triangular load, YCP would be one-third up from Y2 toward Y1. But it's not simply a triangular load. It's, what did we say, a trapezoidal? A combination of triangular and rectangular loads. So this is the center of pressure, and that's the centroid. So that's what we're looking for. Well, you're going to say this is the same moments around point O. Maybe I should have written it like that. I'm going to do the moment about point O of F of R applied at the right CP, the center of pressure, is equal to the moment about point O of the distributed load. Okay, so this one is going to be F of R times YCP. What about over here? Well, I have to do the integration. I have to sum them all up. So it'll be the integral of the perpendicular distance y times the little dfs. We already did that, where it's the df is a, a little p dA. True? Is in my little, I'm thinking about little strips like this, have same pressure. Now I'm going to integrate uh, over that area. So we're going to get the integral of y. What is p? Rho. G, Y, sine, phi, true. And then we're going to have the area is depth B, dy, and we integrate from Y1 to Y2. Did that look good? How many people say, Professor, this is a derivation. It's in the textbook. Let me just read the textbook and I'll be done with it, right? No, no, sometimes it's good to see a derivation. Okay, so let's go continue on. Rho, G, uh, sine of phi, B, they all come outside. We have the integral of Y squared, which is one-third Y cubed, evaluated Y1 to Y2. But let me stop even there. I should even back up. I'm going to have, do this. I'm going to have the integral of Y squared, DA. I should have done that. I should have just left this as, uh, I should have left it like that. Let me change it up. Sorry about that. Integral of the pressure as a function of y, which is rho g sine of phi times y, 
times y dA. What do we recognize as the integral of y squared dA? The area moment of inertia. Uh, this is one of those things where you recognize something, oh, that has a name. I've seen it before. I've seen it in my solid mechanics class. I saw it in my statics class. Oh, I see it in my fluid statics class, or the, fluid, the statics part of my fluid dynamics class, right? Or the, I should rephrase that. I see it in the statics part of my fluid mechanics class. Great. So what is this? This is a symbol I. It's around what axis? It's, it's through this axis that's in the third dimension that you really can't see, but it's in through that point O. So maybe we call it the XX axis. What do you mean XX axis? Well, if I turned it, it would be along like this axis that it's corresponding to here. And since this is the Y direction, we'll call this the X direction. So it's the Y, the I sub XX. It's the area moment of inertia about the xx axis. Okay. Uh, so this is equal to, uh, let me do this, y c sub p. We could probably simplify. What was our formula for f of r? Wasn't our formula for f of r equal to um, rho g sine of phi? times y sub c times area. I'm going to pause. Does that look good? Was that, was that our f of r? Because what I want to do is I want to cancel some terms. And what we find is that we find that we have y sub c area times y sub cp equal to I sub xx. Well, what again do we have? What is, let me jump off, maybe I have it on the next slide. No, here. Do you remember area moment of inertia? Do you remember what is the area moment of inertia for a rectangular area like this? So if I said, I want you to calculate the area moment of inertia about this x axis going through the point C, what does the C, C stand for on this diagram? Centroid. So it's the xx axis, or just the x axis, going through the centroid. Sometimes I'll say that's the centroidal x-axis. That's different than this axis. And you can get an area moment of inertia around that axis, too. It also goes through the point C. It's also a centroidal axis, but it's the Y centroidal axis for the area. Do you think the I sub y, y, and the I sub x, x are the same for this rectangular area where b is larger than h? No. All right. Your tuition. Which one's larger? I, x, x, or I, y, y for the b at the shaded area as shown? I, y, y. You're absolutely correct. All right. So uh, I know that this is copied out of a different source. They only sometimes put one subscript, sometimes two subscripts on these axes, I, X, X. But the formula for I, X, X is 1 12th, the base times the height cubed, where the base is the length in the X axis direction, and the height is really getting the area away from it and adding significantly to the area moment of inertia. Here's a little trick. What is I sub y, y leaving h and b as currently defined? Or h, b cubed, right? True? 
that's good review, right? And so you can see why I sub y, y is larger when b is, in this illustration, b is greater than h, hence you're going to get I sub y, y greater than I sub x, x for that area. You can go get other areas. Here is a semicircular area. You have to be able to get the centroid of that area. Oh, there it is right there. They even worked out the math. It's located at a distance of 4r divided by 3 pi above the x-axis. See what they're giving you right here? That's the location. And it's along this center line, you know, symmetry line, for the, the uh, semicircle. So for this I sub XX, the area moment of inertia for the centroidal X axis is 1 eighth pi R to the fourth. That's just that formula. I didn't re-derive it. How do you derive it? Calculus and do the integral. Um, do you remember the books for statics as well as the book for solids? If, how many people already took solids? How many people have not taken it? Only a few. Most of you have. Well, usually in the textbook they have on the appendix in the back cover or something or some appendix they have a, a pile of these, don't they? Copy a few of them down for your equation sheet. Right? What would you call the one that goes right through C, like the page? Like what would you know that there? Well, now you're, uh, this is 2D, and they have a whole set for 3D. No, they just spun around, or that, that is 3D? That's 3D, and then, then you have a, a disc uh, of plates and stuff. And then they usually have the J for a polar. All right. But let's, let's continue on here. Uh, sometimes they'll put an IXX with a bar on top. Sometimes they'll put IXCXC, like a subscript on the subscript. Sometimes they'll put IXX comma C. What, what are all these trying to say? It's through the, the x-axis that goes through the centroid. See, see this notation? This book right here, it, look it, that is for the centroidal. Sometimes they don't even, you just need to know that they, oh, this is for the centroidal x-axis. Okay. We come back here, and is this I sub xx for the centroidal x-axis for that submerged area? Yeah, the axis where this is calculated from is this one right up here, going through the point O, right? But where is the axis for the centroid of this area? Right there. So what do we do to... Bingo. What do we want to employ? We want to employ the parallel... Axis theorem. All right. Uh, didn't I ask you last time? I said write down the parallel axis theorem from memory. Didn't I? Do you need a break? Should I stop and walk around and see if you can finish this problem out? How would you employ the parallel axis theorem for this problem on this part right here? That's where you're going to need to apply it. So let's jump over here, remind ourselves. If somebody says, I want to calculate, not that one. I got too much on this diagram. Get rid of some of this. Here is the centroidal x-axis. Let's say I want to calculate I sub xx for that axis, which is parallel to the x-axis, but doesn't go through the centroid. How do I... What, is this one going to be larger than I sub xx centroidal? It will be a lot larger, true. Because more area is further away from that axis that you're...
thinking about, I like to think about revolving it, but it's just an area moment of inertia. The mass moment of inertia is dynamics and it's a little more intuitive to me, but it's, let's leave that alone. Okay, so I sub x, x for this axis is going to be uh, here, the parallel axis theorem. I sub x, x is equal to I sub x, x, c plus what? Professor, I need my equation sheet. No, you don't. You're going to remember this because you're a mechanical engineer for the rest of your life. Some distance squared area. Remember, it has to be area to the fourth power, or meters, I'm sorry, meters to the fourth power. That's what each of these have to be. And doesn't that give me the right units? And so what is this D? The distance, perpendicular distance between the two parallel axes. In this case, D is that distance, which would be H over 2. And then what is A? The area B times H. So we come over here and... And I say, uh, I'm going to write down, I'm going to say the uh, parallel axis theorem is going to be the I sub x, x centroidal plus the distance. What is the distance that I need to square it? It'll be y sub c squared. Is it y sub cp squared or y sub c squared? y sub c squared times the area and that's going to be i sub x x so what i can do is i can replace i sub x x by y sub c squared a plus i sub x x c again just a little subscript difference but they're very different one is going through that point o and one is going through the centroid of my area and now, let me just write these parts right here, y sub c a, y sub c p. And then you get this nice, simple equation, y sub c p. I want to know where I should apply at the center of pressure that resultant single force. Well, this is the formula for y sub c p. It's equal to y sub c, almost the centroid of the area, but adjust it by... I sub x, x, c divided by y sub c, a. That makes it hard to read that there. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? All right. Let's play a little game. I take that area, and I had it conceptually right around here, but now I'm going to scoot it up, and I put that area, the same little red area, right at the top. And the top, that edge of the area is at zero. So y sub 1 is equal to zero. True? And then this is y sub 2 right here. Where is, where is y sub c? in this problem up here? One half, and then where is y c sub p? Two thirds down, right? So this will be like one half y two, and this will be two thirds y two. Remember y one is zero. Is that true? All right. We come down and push it to the extreme this way. So we pushed it to the extreme that way. Let's push it to the extreme this way. What do we know about y1 and y2 here? What can we say if it's really, really, really deep, really far out there? y2 is still greater than y1, but neither of them is zero. And you know what? They're getting pretty close to each other's value. There's not much difference between y1 and y2. If I looked at the distributed load, it would still have a huge rectangular part with a little triangular part on top. If you wanted to neglect one of those two parts of the distributed load, as an engineer who doesn't want to get bogged down in math and maybe make an error in some math, 
or wants to double check the computer code because they came out with a ridiculous value, they don't believe it or they shouldn't believe it. They don't want to go to their boss and say, this is what the computer code shows. You know, we need to make that steel plate 22 feet thick. Are you sure we need a 22 foot thick steel plate? That's what the computer code shows. No, 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 no. See, you want to be a good at sometimes throwing out and approximating, right? This is one of those cases. Which would you approximate and throw out? Throw that out. What would be the difference between Y sub C and Y sub CP? It's negligibly closer together. It's small, small, small. <coughs> when do you have the greatest dis difference between Y sub C and Y sub CP? When it's up at the top, when you only have a triangular load on it. And then, it, so, so the point here, the two points are getting, the Y sub C never changes. It's always in the middle. It's the centroid of the area. But Y sub CP will creep toward it as it's getting deeper and deeper and deeper. <coughs> Does that make sense? So, so always Y sub CP is uh, greater than uh, the Y sub C. Okay, sometimes we get bogged down in acronyms. I forgot. Y sub C, what is it? What's the name of Y sub C? Yeah, it's the Y location of the centroid of that submerged planar area. What is Y sub CP? The center of pressure of that planar submerged area. And that's where we apply the single resultant force. Yes? Well, let me do this. How do we do this problem? And mathematically, let me summarize. So we have two things of importance, y sub c and y sub cp. Here, I put y sub p. I don't know why. y sub center of pressure and then the centroid. What is the pressure at the centroid? You should be able to calculate it. Multiply the pressure at the centroid by the area, and you get the resultant force. Then I want to locate where Y of the center of pressure is. It's almost the centroid, but add to it a little bit. What do you add? You add I sub C or I sub XXC, right? It's that centroidal X axis for that area divided by Y sub C A. That's the addition to move it a little further below. Y sub C. So that's a good summary. I don't think any of that's beyond you. You can solve problems. But now let's get to your question, I believe. Oops, why don't I have something better on that? I'm looking for something. All right. How would an engineer solve this problem? I would bust it into two problems that I know how to solve with great confidence if I didn't trust this math. Sometimes we just don't trust our own math. Or uh, this, if I don't trust it, I don't want to, you know, bank on it. So what I, which, could, you, could you take and just put a rectangular distributed load and a triangular distributed load and get F R1 and X of R1 and F of R2 and X of R2 and then have two points and then combine them to a single? Sure. Sure. Absolutely you can. And you'll see me do that again and again. It's a lot easier. But this is a lot, I mean, it's in every fluids book. And so it's uh, pretty compact and pretty fast once you solve a few problems using, using the formula. But you couldn't just place it at two-thirds Y from the depth? The triangular load, you place it two-thirds down from the top or one-third up. If you continue the slope all the way to the surface, and you knew the length of the bottom. Let me, let me move on. All right. So calculate the force that the stop must exert on the bottom of the gate to hold the water back. Let me review this problem. We have water, and then three meters below the water surface, I have a hinge. 
and it begins the gate, and the gate goes down four meters. Let me ask a question. What is the depth of the stop from the surface of the water? Seven meters. Good, you're understanding the problem. You know how easy it is to get confused and say, oh, the depth from the, the stop is uh, four meters from the, from the top of the water surface. No, it's not, it's seven meters. You got that, that's good. It'll help you avoid an error. But what we want to do is we want to calculate the force that the stop applies to hold the water back. What's it going to be applied to? The get bottom of the gate. The top of the gate is hinged, right? So let me see how far you can get on this problem. I'll pause and to take a break, walk around. So uh, some people noticed that I solved this problem in the previous recorded lecture. True? So unfortunately, I can't remake brand new lectures for everything, and so a lot of it I just recycle from semester to semester. But here you go. What do you do? Well, I would say and uh, one uh, approach to solve this problem, the approach that I would typically take is take and bust it into a triangular load and a rectangular load. and Calculate F of A, thinking about this is load A and this is load B. And that will definitely be applied at the centroid of the area. The center of pressure is the centroid of that area. And then F of B, you get the magnitude, and then you apply it one-third up, one-third up. And uh, when you calculate it, the stop has to apply 111 kilonewtons to so that the sum of the moments around this point A, or whatever you want to call it, the top of the, top of the gate where it's hinged, the sum of the moments uh, is equal to zero. So F of A wants to swing it that way, F of B wants to swing it that way, the stop wants to prevent it from swinging. And there you go. Is that solvable? All right, good. So now we talk about submerged curved surfaces. What's different? Well, the surface is curved. Classic example would be a fluid, and then you have some something like this, and you hit over here, and you put some surface to there, and then down again. And what is this? This is my definitely way too much curved surface. And it's submerged. And something's happening at the point A and B on this end and that end to hold it in place. Um, what would be on top of the surface? Well, it's hard to know, but really what I, uh, it could be solid, it could be rock, it could be air. But what, what I want to do is I want to calculate the net force that the fluid, this is the fluid down here, exerts on that submerged curved surface, right? So it's going to try and push it that way and that way. Push it up and push it over, true? Um, this would have F of R in the X and F of R and the Y, and then we would not only need to know the, the um, magnitudes of those forces, but where they're applied on that curved surface. But let's worry first about the magnitude of F of R X and the magnitude of F of R Y. How would I solve for the hydrostatic, the net hydrostatic force acting on a submerged curved surface. Well, in detail, we know that the pressure is always perpendicular to the area, isn't it? That's true, but this is so complicated, maybe there's a simpler way, and there is, for calculating F of Rx and F of Ry. The trick is cut out a section of the fluid. Cut out a section of the fluid where one edge is the curved surface 
and two edges, you know what's happening to it. So often we like planar surfaces, so make them straight. Make them straight and perpendicular to the coordinate system, which is usually aligned with the free surface of the fluid. So, I mean, yes, you can solve the problem where this is my x, uh, here, that's a bad looking x. This is my x and this is my y coordinate system, but that doesn't make much sense. It makes sense to put some sort of coordinate system aligned, x aligned with the free surface of the fluid, and then maybe another coordinate system aligned going down or up. Either way, maybe y going this way and x going that way. Or what did I put? Yeah, something. You could put y going up. Either way. Okay. But I pull out a section. Let me try and draw it like that. And I go back to statics. And what do I know is true about that entity, that little uh, section which is the focus of the study? What do I know about it? It's in equilibrium. So I know that the sum of the forces in the x direction must equal to zero, and the sum of the forces in the y direction must equal to zero. So if I'm focusing only on that fluid section, what I have is I have F of Rx, which is the wall pushing back on that fluid. Instead of over here, F of Rx was the fluid pushing on the wall. Equal and opposite. Likewise, I have F of Ry down where the fluid's pushing possibly up, as I've shown it, on that wall curved surface. Okay, so to do uh, uh, sum of the forces in both directions equal to zero, what do I need to do? I have to get all the right forces. You know, the number one complaint that faculty have after students pass statics is they can't draw a free body diagram. Because what will happen is, is you'll miss something that's important in the free body diagram. You'll leave a force out. True? So let me pause and say, draw a free body diagram for that section of the fluid where we have a cut boundary right here and a cut boundary and then the curved surface is the other edge and we pull that out and we're going to focus the study on that or do I not need to pause can you get them all so what do we have happening on the bottom edge right down here the fluid that's outside of the cut, outside of the focus of the study, that's not part of my free body diagram, it's external to it, is pushing up. Why is it pushing up? Because it's outside and it's always pushing normal to that surface, which is the cut surface, so it's pushing up. Is it the same pressure over the whole area or is the pressure changing as I move? It's the same, it's the same. That's one of the great reasons why this is parallel with that. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, if you make it sloped and crazy surface, it would make it difficult. Then what about over here? Hey, we've done that before. That's a trapezoidal, a submerged surface, right? So we have some pressure here, some pressure there, and it's linearly varying with depth, and it's acting to push in that direction. So I have two distributed force fields of pressure, but what else do I have that a lot of students, and myself included, may forget in the free body diagram? The weight. That's exactly right. So we put the weight. Where does the weight act? The centroid. The centroid of what? The area. Uh, is the density varying of the fluid? Nah, it's liquid. It's not varying. We don't have any var density variation because of depth in water or other liquids. We would neglect that. 
Okay. So with that, what we can do is we can solve for the magnitude of f of rx. If I just say now, apply the sum of the forces in the x, what I have to do is I come over here, maybe I have that uh, two, two forces, but I get the single resultant force, the force that's acting in the horizontal, I like to call it horizontal, x, x of a, x of b, add them up, and that is equal to the force resultant back again from the submerged surface. And then what about the y? The only thing you have to remember in the y is the weight. So you're going to have the force in the vertical pushing up. And then you'll have the weight acting down and the resultant force in the y due to the curved surface acting down as well. And that's it. This is how you solve for those two resultant forces. How about where do I apply it? Well, you can use the principle from statics of transmissibility. What? Principle of what? Transylvania? No. Transmissib... What did I say? Not transmissibility. Trans... Is it? What is that word? where you can transmit it along the line. Transmissibility, right? So um, what you can do is you can find the right angle between these two. Let's I calculate f of r y and f of r x, and I get the single resultant by putting it f of r y and f of r x. And then I can uh, put uh, f of r as a single magnitude, f of r would be the square root of f of r x and f of r y squared. Add them together, take the square root, you have the resultant. And then if I wanted to know this angle uh, phi, right, what would be the angle phi to get the right orientation? Right, right, right. So it would be the arctan of uh, f r x over f r y. Tangent, inverse tangent, or arctan. Do you like it? Let me see, thumbs up if you agree. It's not f r y over f r x. This is x. This is my angle phi. How many people agree? All right. But I still don't know where it's applied. I need to know where it's applied. Well, uh, what, what you have to do is just, um, you can think of applying it somewhere. Uh, uh, it's not necessarily going to go through this center right here. Maybe you apply it at a distance off, offset. So uh, let me come down here. It's, it's, a, it's a problem of statics. Using the principle of transmissibility, you want to, you got the magnitude, you've got the orientation, but it's the point of application, and you would do some of the moments around some point to get the correct point of application. Almost have to work a problem, don't we? All right. This is a problem I did work before. Let me go ahead and work through it again. A long, solid cylinder of radius one meter in length three meters is hinged at point A and is used to as a gate, a, high, a, a water gate. So here's our radius. What is this three meter length? Where is that shown? It's into the board. It's really hard to show, but it's three meters length, depth. Okay. And it's a gate. What do you mean by a water gate? Well, if the water level is low, What's going to happen to this heavy cylinder sitting here? It's hinged at A. It's actually going to rest on the cement floor. And that means the cement floor is going to be pushing up to hold it from falling. Just like I'm standing on the floor of this building, there's uh, some floor is supporting my weight. True. So it's going to be supporting 
the weight of the cylinder, but it's not going to be supporting the entire weight of the cylinder because the fluid, if the fluid was down to here, nothing, then this reaction force would equal to the weight. But as the water level goes up and up and up and up and up, what happens to the reaction force? It goes down. And eventually the reaction force goes to zero. And at that point, the gate's going to come up and some water's going to go out the bottom, slide out. True? So if the water wanted to go up more, maybe you're filling the tank with some fluid, then the, the, it, would, it would raise and let water out. If it went up higher, it'd raise even more, let more water out. So that's, our, that's the concept of the water gate. Hopefully, you, 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 that's in mind there that the key is this reaction. How much force does the floor provide to the bottom of that cylinder? Well, when it's ready to open, when it reaches a level, the water level reaches eight meters, the cylinder gate opens, the reaction force goes to zero, and the, 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 the cylinder rotates a little bit around the hinge and lets some water out. So for part A, determine the hydrostatic force acting on the cylinder. The hydrostatic force acting on the cylinder. Well, this is a curved surface. Let me change the color right here that's submerged. It's not planar, it's curved. Actually, it has a constant radius, doesn't it? That's our curved surface. And so we want to calculate the force that the water exerts, the hydrostatic force acting on that cylinder. Let's take a look at part B right away. The force's line of action when the gate opens. What the hydrostatic force's line of action let me do this to clean it up. Right here, I have a little section of that cylinder. The force that the hydrostatic is always perpendicular to the surface, isn't it? If I just project this line back, where does it go? Right always through the center of the cylinder. How about if I look at this little area and I have the hydrostatic force? It always goes through the center of the cylinder. It all, even this little bit right there, it goes through the center of the cylinder, it goes through the center of the cylinder. So the, the, uh, no matter where it's acting on the surface, it's always projected to go through the center of the cylinder. So all of the little lines of action go through there. All right, and then we're going to calculate the weight of the cylinder. Well, let's do this. What do I want to do to analyze this problem for part A to get the hydrostatic force acting on the cylinder? Free body diagram, and I want to cut out a section of fluid and analyze the fluid. So this is my fluid section, fluid section, and then my curved surface. So that's what we pull out. It could be just like this. If you want it to, you could bring it back, put more fluid in it, but it doesn't need to be that way. That's our fluid section right there. Okay, That's a curved surface. Uh, oh, well. And what do we have operating on the bottom? Uniform pressure. What about here? Trapezoidal pressure field. And then we're going to be interested in the force F. This, this is F of Rx, and this is F of Ry. That's the force that the cylinder pushes on that water, and then we know that just the opposite is what the water pushes on the cylinder. Okay, so um, how do I calculate? I got to call things different names, F of V. The vertical force due to what's the bottom, along the bottom. Well, isn't that going to be the pressure at the bottom? Pressure, maybe you put pressure 8 meters depth, P8, you know, times some, some uh, area. What is this area? Won't it be R for radius? Times, and then I should give a symbol for this, R for radius. And then what about the length? Call it L, because L. RL? 
L is 3 meters, R is 1 meter, and pressure at 8 is rho G8. So it's uh, rho G times 8 meters times 1 meter times 3 meters. Uh, you solve a lot of water problems. What's the density of water? Kilograms per meter cube. What is G? 9.81 meters per second squared. Somebody says it's more convenient to put 9.81 Newton per kilogram. Is that G? Is G 9.81 Newton per kilogram? It sure is. This is G as things are let to fall in the Earth's gravitational field. This is as things need to be supported to prevent them from falling in the Earth's gravitational field, so you know the relationship between weight and mass. And this one's probably the, more, the, 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 the best one to use. So when I have a rho G for water, it's 9.81 kilonewton per meter cubed. Where'd the kilo come from? The kilo and thousand? So you have 9.81 kilo newtons per meter cubed. That's the weight of the water per unit volume of the water. What was the symbol given for rho g in fluids? Was it sg, the specific gravity? Was it uh, gamma, the the specific weight, gamma. What was the name of gamma? Specific weight. Specific weight. It's the weight per unit volume, rho g. All right. So a lot of times you can get bogged down handling this term, or you can just figure it out. Like, <laughs> it's, that's gamma for water. What's water? Weight density or specific weight, whatever you, different names are, are called, but it's 9.81 kilonewtons per cubic meter. All right, um, we know how to handle this f of r y. I didn't say it was easy, I said you, you bust it into two components, right? This component, that component, and you get the resultant force due to this hydrostatic load over here, pushing that way. And we have our weight acting down. Okay, that's a little bit of work for the weight. What is our weight acting down, this W right here? The volume. But how do I calculate the volume? It's really not that hard. If I said it was this whole square, that would be R squared. But you subtract off one quarter of the circles, right? So you subtract off one fourth of pi r squared. Isn't that going to give you this area right in here? r squared minus one fourth pi r squared? No, what did I put one fourth? Yeah, I did. That's right. One fourth. One fourth pi r squared, true. And then I multiply by the L. Three, three meter depth, that'll give me my volume. Then I multiply by rho g or gamma. Will that give me the weight? Right. Okay. Okay. So the weight comes in at like 6.32 kilonewton. Somebody go ahead and run those numbers. I'm going to pause. And let's get what F of V is. You go ahead and make those calculations. When somebody gets F of V, let me know. What do you have? So you got for the weight uh, 6.32 kilonewton. And then how about F of V? 235.4 kilonewton. Let's get a verification. So you, you verified? 
Very good. Another couple? Good. Anybody else? Good, good. Any other verifications? All right. So guess what f of r y is? It's f of v minus w, isn't it? Okay. Uh, the same thing happens for this distributed loads over here. Um, we know it's at 8 meters. This is 7 meters depth right here. So the, the pressure at the top, uh, uh, this is 7 meters. So the pressure A, let me call this A, and then this is B, is going to be um, um, gamma rho G times 7 meters. And then the pressure B at the bottom is going to be gamma times 8 meters. And then we want to know F of A. It'll be uh, the pressure at A times the, uh, the radius R times the length L. And F of B will be 1 half the pressure at B minus the pressure at A. P, B bottom, let me do this, one-half times uh, um, gamma one meter times R times L. That, that makes sense? I'm doing the, the triangular load, which is really only an additional depth of one meter. And so gamma times one meter times R L, the area, Divide by half, you have F of B. F of A is equal to um, gamma times 7 meters times RL. And then where do I apply X of A? X of A will be right in the middle, right there. So if you're moving down from point A, it's equal to R over 2 or 0.5 meter. And then X of B, if you're moving down from part A, it's right there. It'll be two-thirds of R, or two-thirds, point uh, six, six, seven meter down. But <clears throat> if you do the sum of the forces in the X, F of R, X is equal to F of A plus F of B. What does F of R, X come in at? I have 220.7 kilonewton. Maybe I should uh, put in some numbers here. What is gamma? 9.81. What is R1? L3. Who gets F of A? What is F of A equal to? And then F of B? You got it? You got around 220? Or you, hold it. Which one did you get? F of A is 206. And then about 14 more for F of B. So the resultant force, F of R total, will be F of R X squared plus F of R Y squared. I come in at 318 kilonewton. And then you know that it's at an angle. Phi, the inverse tangent of those, you get 46.1 degrees. And because every little segment goes through this point right here, we know that the resultant force has to go through that point too. And so now the resultant force is specified by knowing it goes through this point. Then we know the total magnitude, and we know the angle phi, and so we get like that. 46.1 degrees magnitude. So if you want to know the, the magnitude of the hydraulic force acting on the cylinder, that's the answer to part A. Its line of action when the gate opens, it's characterized by this angle. 
And the weight of the cylinder, uh, well, what about the weight of the cylinder? Let's do this. Um, if I do now a free body diagram of the cylinder right here, I have a hinge at A, and I have a resultant force of F of Rx and F of Ry, and the reaction at the support at the floor is equal to zero when it starts to lift off, true? And then I have the weight acting down, W. This hinge, can it exert any force? Well, let's do this. Do the sum of the moments around point A. If I do the sum of the moments around point A, the force acting at A doesn't play. F of X goes through the line of action of A. And so all I get is that F of R Y times R making it want to spin or rotate in the uh, counterclockwise minus um, the weight times R. This is zero. That has to be equal to zero for equilibrium. The R's cancel. And the weight of the cylinder is simply F of Ry. And F of Ry was 230, 229, 229 kilonewtons. Don't put two equal signs in the box. I break my own rules, but I'm running out of room. Sorry. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's just starting to slip, just starting to rotate, yeah. Okay, <coughs> we'll stop here.